Hello Visual Effects people, I'm AK and this is Fluid Ninja Live. It is simulation to create character and environmental effects. And it could be used alone for simple effects and it could drive other systems like particles and volumes and landscape materials and 3D visuals could be done. As a first step, I would like to showcase what Ninja is capable of. Then we are going through the basic concept with the help of this level. And finally, at the end of this video, uh, we check out how to set up a simulation from scratch. So, first let me start by randomly clicking through the use case levels. This stage is demonstrating caustics. This is a complex level. We have particles, volumes and an infinite sea surface. And we could even mount a vehicle. Zoom in and uh, change weather and daylight patterns. There is also a stormy version for this level. And we have a quiet version of the same level. And some nice shallow water. We are demonstrating foliage here. Our simulation is generating a velocity field. And this field is used to distort the foliage meshes. We also have some additional simulation going on generating this smoke coming out of the harvester. This level is demonstrating how to drive the fluid simulation using particles. This setup is a flamethrower and it is actually using a stream of particles as input for the fluid simulation. Here we could drive the particles using fluid velocity field. This level is about fire. We have campfires, bonfires, burning logs, heavy oily smoke and the particle driven setup. We also have some candles and there are character effects as well. Mm -hmm. This level is called the volcano and we could steer these huge columns of smoke rising from the top of the hill. We could also adjust scene lighting. This is a quick test for lava. Using some local simulations and volumetric smoke. This level is demonstrating small water bodies, like this waterfall, where we could push things around. We also have a scene with these huge globes of water. And we have this caustic scene with a pool-like setup. We are demonstrating vehicle trails. And here is a very simple setup. Just one simulation actor with an opaque water surface and it could run 500 FPS on an RTX 3080. This is an old time favorite called the Roots. Again level lights could be moved and the smoke lighting changes accordingly. This level is demonstrating how a single simulation actor and a single volume smoke actor could create large areas of volumetric smoke. 
This is unlit, so running very fast and efficient. And we have a lit version of the same thing here. We have a few classic levels for volume clouds. Another volume cloud demonstration level. And another one. So that was the showcase part, and we are returning to this generic introduction level. So we have been quickly going through the use case levels, but apart from this, you could find an official playlist on YouTube. Demonstrating all content has been released to Ninja ever since. It is called Fluid Ninja Live Showcase, and it comes like with 30 videos or 40 since the beginning of time. Now, let us get through these five points as we start this video. First, what kind of skills do you need to learn Ninja? Well, lower intermediate skills would be fine, which means you need to be familiar with concepts like actors and components, materials and material instances, and it's needed to know what a render target is. But it's really just a basic knowledge. Also, the manual is essential and you really need to read parts on your own. So in case you do not like reading, your chances are a bit lower to learn Ninja. Now, what learning resources we have? First and most important is the project homepage. It is at the marketplace and there you could see these yellow colored links to the manual to live 1.7 specific playlist tutorials and all that. So you could just click through these links. Also you could read a short description about Ninja features here. And here is this section called questions. So you could ask things here. Second, you could check the manual. It is always updated and you could read the latest version numbers at the first page and the content is at the second page. It's pretty well organized and if you're looking for something you could just click on that uh, chapter and it's jumping there. For example chapter 24 volumetrics and there we go in three pages we are explaining what kind of volumetrics is supported and there is a step-by-step -step guide how to set it up so the manual is really helping you uh, to understand certain topics. Also, we have introductory chapters. I also recommend page 3 in the manual because it is a list of step-by-step -step guides and also you could see what kind of tutorials we have on YouTube. For example, character effects, series 5 episodes, or how to use sequencer and movie render queue, stuff like that. So uh, I really advise you to have a look at the manual and use it as much as you can. Now, um, YouTube is essential. So, uh, in case you're watching this video, and again, you're just uh, clicking on the username, it is taking you to my main channel. And there you could see uh, these playlists, like Fluid Ninja Live 1.7 specific videos, uh, tutorials and features playlist, showcases, use cases, and such. So. There we go, the Fluid Ninja Live Tutorials and Features playlist is essential. Basically all videos in the timeline categorized and you could just go through one by one. And uh, here we have this character effects tutorial at the end. We even have Chinese language tutorials. Also this playlist, mm, Live 1.7 is essential 
basically we have a video with all new features listed all new content listed and this video currently in the making is going to be inserted into this playlist as well apart from the YouTube videos you could go through uh, the tutorial levels and the use case levels please have a look at the content browser we have these two root folders tutorial and use cases both root folders contain a, a, a subfolder called levels tutorial per levels contains like uh, 32 levels you could go through uh, these levels one by one and there are a large amount of level placed text with video links and it is uh, helping you to digest this content the same is true for the use cases and finally I would like to advise uh, the tooltips say I'm selecting an InjaLive uh, actor and I'm going to the details panel wherever I uh, stick with my mouse if I float over a, a certain um, variable or function or input field we have some kind of explanation which is really helpful in case you would like to figure out what that certain function is doing so uh, that's about uh, learning resources now I would like to emphasize the most important bit Ninja is a project which means it could be added to your project by merging it and we have a very specific guide that is manual chapter 9 describing how to merge it I'm just going there to demonstrate so uh, here is the manual here's chapter 9 and it is uh, compressed to a single page so on a single page there is this step-by-step -step guide describing what is exactly that you uh, have to do in order to make Ninja working in your project and this is even illustrated with screenshots we also have a video version for it so uh, that is very important and we are going to start this level by simply using the play selected viewport option I emphasize do not use simulate use selected viewport why described in the manual and finally uh, I'm again reminding us we are going to have at the end of this video um, a quick glimpse how we could set up simulation from scratch so um, here we go and let us start uh, with stage one so we are on stage one and the question is what is ninja and we have a simple definition for this it is a painter and the painter data is feeding a simple two-dimensional fluid simulation and the fluid simulation output is channeled to user-defined materials I'm pressing play and having a look at this demonstration stage we could see that we have two objects moving there no fluid simulation it's actually just uh, registering the position of these objects and we are writing the registered position to paint buffer and the paint buffer is visualized by an output material so at the moment we are simply skipping the fluid simulation so uh, I'm selecting ninja live actor going to the actor details panel and first and most important thing I am resizing this components list because otherwise it is a bit too small so I have to resize it and when I resize it an important component appears which is ninja live component almost all parameters are listed in this component so when you select the actor you have live activation and live interaction as available parameter groups and if you select ninja live component you have like uh, seven or eight different parameter groups so in ninja live component per live interaction I'm going to the bottom here simple painter mode again the tooltip is explaining what it is but I'm just switching it off and this way uh, we have fluid simulation applied on top of this simple painter so that is how ninja works a painter a fluid simulator and some output materials now let us have a look at these output materials again I'm selecting ninja live actor 
going to the component and in the live generic parameter group I could find an array, a list, named as output materials. It is a user-defined list, so you could add your own slots and add your own materials or remove the existing ones. So these are just examples. As you could see, there is an index above this output materials list. It is called the output material selected and it is currently set to zero, which means Ninja is using number zero, the first in the list which is density buffer black. Again, if I start playing, well, it is pretty much a fluid simulation density black. No question about it. So what happens if I, uh, I'm changing this index? Say uh, I would like to visualize the pressure buffer. Okay, let's do that. And there we go. We could visualize the, the pressure waves. Or what happens if I pick uh, a material which is uh, made for some flaming ball, maybe? Number four. And there we go, a fire-like thing appears. And you could also open up these material instances by simply double-clicking them. And then you have this uh, list of parameters like color and uh, normal mapping, opacity and all these kind of things. So you could tweak the existing materials. You could clone the existing materials by just browsing there, creating a, a duplicated version and using that and also you could create your own materials from scratch. Uh, this will be explained a bit later on. So that is how Ninja works and so much about output materials. Stage 2 Shapes A simple most important statement about Ninja that it is not tracking shapes but points like object pivots, bones, particles and sockets. Please have a look at this stage. Uh, what's the difference between these two Tetris blocks? The yellow one, the big one, is leaving a simple track and the other one looks like Ninja is being able to somehow get the shape of that thing. And the explanation is that it is a single object and this one is made of four different objects. So. In this case, with this colorful shape, Ninja is actually tracking four different objects and four different object pivot points. And that is why we could see the shape. And in this case, the pivot point is located there and Ninja is just tracking that pivot point. So, uh, what happens if you would like to make um, approximate an object shape? You could do like adding bones, adding sockets or adding invisible colliders. So, if I would add these objects to this one and simple, simply hide them, I would get to the same result. Say you have like a, a boat or a car, you could pimp it up with your own invisible objects or sockets or bones and this way make Ninja aware of the shape of that object. Here I'm just uh, mentioning it sideways in a bracket that on uh, Tutorial level 3, and I'm just going there, simulation inputs. Still, you could find examples for Ninja being able to detect shape. You see this floating pawn here? We are actually detecting the shape, just like with this ball and with uh, this particle stream. But it is uh, kind of cheating, because we are using a scene capture camera and it is a tedious setup to attach uh, a scene capture camera to your uh, object or pawn or, or whatever you would like to track and capture the contours. So in some cases it might work, but in general it is not advised. Also, uh, and just getting to another stage here. Uh, of course, uh, Ninja could use textures as simulation input. So it is not that uh, we have only this option of tracking points, but again, a texture is usually a static texture. So you could create like a flaming uh, emblematic shape or, uh, or a portal using textures, like in this case. But in general, if we are tracking dynamic objects, we are relying on tracking points. And now I'm getting back to this uh, stage two. So point tracking. The next thing I would like to cover is interaction. Because it is not automatic. 
and I would like to explain how Ninja is detecting objects. Uh, I'm jumping to the takeaway message. We have object types and we need to set a Ninja to detect these object types. So it's like pairing the object type and Ninja uh, directly watching that object type. And we should also set an important setting in the objects, which is generate overlap events. Now let us quickly uh, demonstrate this. First, if I select any of these objects and I go to the details panel and I check uh, the mesh component, I could see that in the collision settings it is defined as word dynamic. So the object type is word dynamic. And if I select Ninja on the actor level in the live interaction group, here overlap filter inclusive object type. I could see that word dynamic is added to the list. If I remove it from the list, only pawn remains. And if I start the simulation, Ninja is not detecting these objects because this uh, class filter is uh, like uh, enabling or disabling Ninja to see different kind of object. It's a very good way to organize your scenes. If I add back word dynamic, or objects appear again. Now uh, there is one important, uh, well let's say a cheating built in in live version 1.7. Say I, I disable word dynamic but I still would like to track this single object. I could do this by selecting the mesh component and adding a tag for it. Say component tag should be my target and I'm going to the Ninja Live actor and at live interaction here is this option called track actor primitive components with tag and if I paste my target here I expect my object appear there we go the yellow block is leaving a trail so uh, apart from class filtering we could force Ninja to track objects tagged objects but in general it is like um, to make your life a bit easier but to organize large scenes, you really need to use uh, class filters. Now, the second most important thing, if you select an object, and again going to the colliding part, so it is the mesh component usually that collides, and go to the collision section, here, uh, generate overlap events. Uh, when you drag objects on level, Unreal has this option disable by default. And it is really important. If you if it is not enabled, Ninja is not detecting these objects. So you really need to switch it on, generate overlap events. Again, as a test, uh, I could switch it off and Ninja would not detect it. Well, there is a small exception. If my object is already in the starting area, but I will not get into the details yet. The sure thing is, if you just set it enabled, generate overlap events. So uh, that was stage two with shapes and what is needed to make objects interact with Ninja. Also uh, later on we will see that we could interact with uh, skeletal meshes and I'm just telling you that here you need to add pawn to the overlap filter and also you will see how we are adding bone names to track certain specific bones. And that's it for stage two. Adding one more thing to stage two is brush size. If you select Ninja Live Actor and the component, there is this option group called param uh, Live Brush Settings. And here you could see various uh, scaling options, but the uh, highest ranking is Global Brush Scale. So if I uh, double it, you will notice how thick the brush becomes. This way you could adjust uh, basically how much area your uh, object is taking, how thick the track is actually which the object leaves. You could also adjust brush size at a different place. In the content browser you could drag preset manager to level. This actor is called Ninja Live 6. So when I start this level I select Ninja Live 6 in the preset manager and there I have this brush option. If I set it to 0, 1, we have these tiny brush size. I set it to 1, it's enormous. So two options to influence brush size in the preset manager 
and also add the component details per brush settings. Shortly that's it. And I'm moving on to stage 3, which is a Ninja Live Actor Components. I'm in the editor. What kind of components do we have? Please notice the two boxes and one grey plane. And looking at the actor details, one box is, the large one, is the activation volume. It is used uh, to wake and sleep Ninja. Basically, if the activator agent is inside the activation volume, Ninja is awake. When the activator agent is outside of that volume, Ninja is sleeping. It's a very good way to optimize your levels as your player is advancing through the level. The second, the smaller one, is interaction volume. Everything inside the interaction volume could cause interaction. Objects outside of the interaction volume, doesn't matter if they are tagged or the class filter is matching or overlap is switched on, if an object is outside of the interaction volume, it is not going to cause any interaction with Ninja. That is often the cause that your uh, vehicles or boats or whatever are not interacting with Ninja because uh, probably the interaction volume is, is uh, not properly defined or somewhere else. So please take care with this. And finally, Trace Mesh, this grey plane. And this is uh, a multifunctional component. First, we are shooting rays from the camera and to actually project the position of overlapping objects on this plane. And second, we could optionally use this to display the simulation. So please have a look at this yellow ball. I'm just selecting it. And if I start uh, the simulation, you could see this ball moving and a strange flickering is happening. And let me shortly explain. As the yellow ball is getting outside of the activation volume, I'm just selecting it. You see, this is the activation volume, the yellow one. As the ball is getting outside the activation volume, Ninja is falling asleep. It's silly. Usually an activation volume is at least 50 or 100 meters large, so I was just downscaling it to demonstrate the whole thing. And the second, Ninja is already awake, indicated by the black trace mesh, but somehow, at this upper part of the trace mesh, it is not leaving a trail. And it is because the interaction volume is much smaller. Again, you could see this yellow, smaller cuboid body as the interaction volume, and the object is only uh, interacting with Ninja inside that volume. If I want to make this object interact with the whole thing, I could resize it. And there, we have arrived to an important question. How do I rescale these components or Ninja Live actor as a whole? Please do not use the transform, do not try to, <laughs> to scale it with the transform gizmo, it is strictly forbidden. Instead, select the actor and at live activation you could size the activation volume, you could even switch it off, which means uh, the sleep-wake wake function is not uh, important anymore as Ninja is going to be awake all the time. You could also uh, switch off the visualization of the activation volume. So I have switched it off. Right now Ninja is awake all the time. Second thing I do is again selecting by the actor, going to the live interaction. Here, uh, interaction volume size. I'm resizing it and this way I'm covering the whole area. And so my ball is leaving a trail all the time. So that is how I scale the interaction volume. I could also select the component and move it. And finally, scaling trace mesh is happening the same way, selecting the actor and in the live interaction here, uh, trace mesh size. Now, if I rescale the trace mesh, there is another adjustment have to be made. Imagine that we have a simulation running on the trace mesh and I select the component, go to the performance group and I have to adjust the simulation resolution accordingly. In this example, the simulation uh, side ratio is 1 by 2 and I have to do the same thing with the simulation res, 1 by 2. Otherwise you will get a silly aspect and the whole thing is going to look glitchy. So that is uh, the role of these different components and that is how you scale them. Mesh size, 
and simulation resolution are paired. And that's it with stage 3. One addition to stage 3, we have been talking about the activation volume and I have disabled it. Now in some cases it is enabled, it depends on what setup you are examining and on which level. Now the thing is that Ninja is uh, compatible with sequencer and movie render queue. We have a dedicated video for sequencer and we also have a dedicated manual chapter. Also manual 23.3 is covering movie render queue. But one important message is that cinematic cameras are usually not triggering the activation volume. So, in case you have a Ninja Live actor with this spawn proximity thing enabled, this sleep wake function enabled, it is usually remaining sleep asleep when the cinematic camera is trying to capture it, which is annoying because you won't see the simulation. And uh, so all you need to do is uh, switch off this sim activated by pawn proximity. So the simulation is always awake and this way um, the, the cinematic camera is going to capture it successfully. Uh, that's the addition for stage 3. We are at stage 4 and as you could see we have a character standing here. If I press play uh, I remain a spectator so I cannot control the character. But oftentimes I would like to do that and pretend I'm in a gameplay. And this is where Ninja Live Utilities comes to the picture. I'm selecting this thing uh, labeled with this green end icon. In the content browser you could uh, find it Ninja Live Utilities and you could just simply drag it on level. This is a helper tool which means it is not needed to the compiled final ninja in the game. It is helping you to develop your effects. If I go to the actor details panel I could see options to set uh, frame per second. I could see options for depth of field, motion blur. I could also add a widget. Uh, this widget is going to enable me to rotate the scene lights and zoom with the character camera. And the most important option is possess nearest pawn. It is very often that we have multiple pawns located on the level. And it would be a tedious job uh, to always eject and possess different pawns. But in case if I have this option switched on, possess nearest pawn, I just have to move nearby in the editor. And there we go, I'm already possessing that pawn. And here is the widget I was talking about. I could zoom in and out and I could also control the level main lights. Again, it is a very handy developer feature. So much about this Ninja Live Utilities actor. I'm just removing the widget because it is slightly annoying in the viewport. And so, what do we have on stage 4? On stage 3, we have been talking about the scaling of sim components. And I repeat, you should never use the transform gizmo, but always visit the dedicated scaling options at the actor details. And so, how about simulation rotation? Well, it is very important. In this case, with the Tetris blocks, I'm just visiting this stage, you might have, uh, oh sorry, <laughs> I'm already possessing the pound, so I switch it off. Oh yeah, so, approaching the stage, you might have noticed that we have uh, this camera facing plane option enabled, which means uh, the trace mesh is always trying to look towards the camera and the simulation is running on this camera facing plane. So wherever I go, this plane is facing the camera. And in case I, if I switch this on, uh, in the live component, live interaction, camera facing. There is nothing more I have to do with the sim rotation. Now, we have a different case. In case uh, we are possessing the pawn, I need to set one important thing. And this one, by selecting Ninja Live Actor, is the main transform. In the actor transform, you see, rotation is set to absolute. There is this roll down menu, relative. Now what happens if I set it to relative? That is the Unreal default. So if you're attaching an Ninja Life component to any of your moving objects, be it a vehicle or a character, your simulation um, is going to look like this. And this is a real glitch and it's <laughs> we are not happy about it. And for this reason, 
uh, I am warning you that uh, the simulation should be word aligned so aligned with the level main X Y axis and to achieve this I have to select the actor and set the rotation to word which means absolute so it is not following the facing of the palm anymore so much about rotation the next thing I would like to cover is sim component position that might be important as well uh, let me just um, zoom in a little bit oh sorry and so uh, what happens if I jump look uh, the trace mesh is not following me now how is it possible since uh, if I look at the word outliner I could see that uh, ninja live actor is parented to the palm it is because in the live interaction I have set an axis lock movement is logged on this axis Z if I switch it off or set it to none and I'm trying to jump a silly thing happens the simulation is, is going to follow me well in some cases it might be okay say I would like to use this simulation um, to generate dust and I'm running uh, uphill on a sand dune this is fine but say I have a watery surface and I'm <laughs> and I'm able to <laughs> I'm unable to leave the surface because the, the water is following me and this is always interacting with me now uh, if I lock the z-axis you could see uh, it's not following me anymore on that axis uh, so I advise you to have a look at these options live component per live interaction and the bottom six options uh, quantizer is explained or tutorial level 32 we also have a dedicated video for this but there is one thing I really would like to demonstrate here you see this is the default option no quantizer and texture offset is on and it is automatic that is a major achievement if you have a look what happens we are properly leaving the fluid behind wherever I go and in previous ninja versions this was not the case so how did it look like if I switch on the texture offset we could have an idea <laughs> well uh, uh, the simulation is following the pound on a silly way so it's not lugging behind it's not being uh, offset it not left behind at all it is basically not uh, suitable to have a word space effects so we call this feature the word space offset and it is on by default and it is helping us to build large scale systems later on you will see that we are going to use our limited local simulation uh, to map it on infinite surfaces and this word space offset is essential for that so we could lock the trace mesh and we could uh, have this uh, word space offset enabled by default and that's the thing we need to know about uh, the position of simulation components and moving in word space that's about stage four. Oh, and there is one more thing to talk about namely uh, the most important thing how do we interact with the pound on stage 2 we have already mentioned that Ninja needs to be set up to detect certain kind of objects and this is no different in this case if you go to Ninja Live Actor per live interaction here overlap filter inclusive object types and of course we have the pawn in the list so if I remove this part I delete this entry and I um, start the gameplay there is no interaction and this is simply because this object here is classified as pawn and ninja is uh, set to ignore this class so I'm re-adding it and apart from uh, detecting uh, the pawn it is also important in the case of skeletal meshes which bones that we would like to track so again you could select a skeletal mesh open it up in, uh, in the editor and see what kind of bones we have and so you could um, name them one by one and tell Ninja which one would you like to track so in this case I'm tracking two bones and the legs 
I go to Ninja Live, Actor Details, but Live Interaction, and do you see this Overlap Filter Inclusive Bone Names Exact? I'm rolling it down and we have Food Left and Food Right named as the bones that we would like to track. So this is how it looks like, tracking only two bones. In case if I remove these bone definitions, Ninja is trying to track all the bones successfully, but you could also see this warning, tracking uh, like 68 bones, that's a lot and Ninja is not recommending us to do this. So uh, <laughs> you could simply uh, add back these bone names. Food left and food right. So that's it. And there is one more thing I would like to add, and it is related to vehicles. Um, because in some, in some cases we also add bones to vehicles. And that is a problem, because Ninja is not, um, well, not properly prepared for this. I'm visiting uh, use case level number 5, called vehicle, um, yeah, use case level, not the tutorial, but the use case level 5, and vehicle trails. Okay, so in this case, we have this uh, car with four wheels going on, and if I if I'm having a look at uh, how the car is set up, uh, first thing I notice, um, just a second, I'm just trying to select the car. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. So, um, this is one important thing. So, if I if you select the car mesh, and uh, you go to the collision settings, normally and naturally, it is defined as vehicle, which is fine because Ninja could detect vehicles. But it's going to be handled as a single pivot point, like with all, all um, like with all other meshes. And Ninja is only tracking bones in case you define something as bone. So um, since we have these uh, four wheels um, controlled by four bones, I really have to define the car as a bone in order for Ninja to track it. So if I select the Ninja Live actor, I could see that the overlap filter is set to pawn, and these are the bone names, wheel front, wheel left, front left, front right, and stuff like that. So um, uh, this is how Ninja is capable to track vehicles with bones. Just wanted to let you know because it's slightly annoying, and I'm sorry about this, but <laughs> this is being the case, uh, because some of the vehicles doesn't have bones. You could also define it as, as a vehicle and add invisible colliders to the wheels, as we have been talking about it. So there are many ways to go, just wanted to let you know. And there is also, uh, in case you feel like editing blueprints, you could open up a uh, Ninja Live blueprint and uh, visit uh, subgroup 12, which is ongoing overlap check, begin overlap detection. I'm entering this group and you see uh, we have a bool gate here, a yes or no filter. And at this very point, Inja is deciding if an object is categorized as a pawn, it is sending to uh, analyze the bones. If it is not a pawn, it is sending it to analyze the, the pivot points. So in case you would like to automatize this or do it uh, properly, you could just um, extend this list and add a vehicle filter as well. So pawn and vehicle being sent to uh, get the bones. This is how you could uh, fix it for yourself in case you have vehicles with bones. In short, that's it. We are on stage 5 and again we have a character here. But this time is different. I'm going to the actor details and I'm resizing the component window to reveal that Ninja Life component is actually added to the character. So, as opposed to this case on stage 4, where Ninja Live actor was simply parented, attached, linked to this character, but as you could see it is a separate actor, which is just following the pawn. In this case I don't have a Ninja Live actor. 
Instead, I have added Ninja Life component. How do you do that? First, in the content browser, you could see there is a separate object here, Ninja Life component. And in case you are creating a character in a blueprint, in C++, or in the editor, here is this button Add Component, and you start to type in Live, and there you go, Ninja Live component. Very easy to add. Uh, why do we do this? Well, it is very handy because the character is taking this component with itself all the time. It, they could be spawned together, so it's very handy, but it has certain limitations. The most important limitation is that Ninja Live Actor have, uh, these, uh, has these activation and interaction volume, so it is actually managing overlapping objects, detecting them and stuff like that. Ninja Life component does not have any overlap detection mechanisms. So the only thing I could do, and I'm going to live interaction, is to switch on continuous interaction with owner actor. Is basically tracking something all the time. Now, what is the thing I'm tracking? Uh, first, let me start this character. This is a torch bearer palm. So obviously, I'm uh, tracking um, the top part of this torch. And how am I doing this? In the component per live interaction, I'm telling Ninja Live component uh, to. Uh, you see this array? Continuous interaction component names exact. So I basically provided Ninja with this torch head thing. And that is the name of this part of the torch. So basically that is how Ninja knows which parts to track. I could also uh, select uh, which uh, I could, in case of if I would like to track uh, skeletal meshes, um, I could define it here telling Ninja to, to track a pawn, and I could provide it with bone names, so I could do the same maneuvers of filtering maneuvers I did here with Ninja Live Actor, except uh, there's not going to be like overlapping uh, start and end events. Ninja is going to track these objects all the time, so there is not, nothing like uh, entering interaction volume and leaving that volume. It is on. Of course you could switch it off with, uh, by using an interface or by adjusting the materials or uh, killing it by a blueprint. So there are ways to get rid of this thing, but by default is on all the time. And there is no overlap detection. That is uh, the takeaway message here. I'm also recommending you to have a look at the related chapter of the manual and we have a dedicated video that is the first episode of the character effects tutorial adding ninja live component to your character. Um, the rotation of the sim components uh, the same applies. Uh, if I start simulation and switch the wireframe mode on I have a camera facing plane that is where the flame is rendered. In this case, there is nothing to do. In case if this would be um, a word aligned uh, simulation, like in this case, say the trace mesh is parallel with the ground and it remains so, I have to select the actor and select um, the trace mesh component and set the transform rotation to absolute. So I would do the same thing as I did with the actor, which I have attached to the pound, but this time I would do it with, um, with the trace mesh only, because I don't have a separate ninja actor, and so I'm setting this uh, rotation locking on the, on, the in on the component level by selecting ninja live trace mesh. So much about ninja live component and its limitations specifically the lack of interaction and overlap detection and also this specific way of locking it if needed. That's it about stage 5. I would like to mention one more thing regarding stage 5. In live interaction you might have noticed this option enabled single target mode and I have a separate stage prepared to demonstrate this on tutorial level to stage 3. We have two separate stages and very fast moving objects on both stages and you, as you could see uh, stage left is capturing the object trajectory in discrete steps while the stage on the right is um, 
successfully drawing an interpolated line between the captured uh, positional data points. So, this option, single target mode, is created uh, to enable Ninja to focus on a single point and draw a nice interpolated trajectory, motion trajectory, for this point. In case we have very fast moving objects, I advise you to switch this on. Returning to stage 5, we have this option enabled in Ninja Live component per live interaction, single target mode on. So, recapping all these options. We have added Ninja Live component to the pawn. We don't have overlap detection. We do not have interaction volume. Instead, we have enabled continuous interaction with owner actor. We have defined the torch head as the object that we would like to track. And we enabled single target mode, so in case uh, if the character and the torch is moving fast, still we are uh, rendering nice smooth motion trajectory. So shortly that's the story. And finally, I would like to recommend the flowchart to you, which is nicely summing up all the things that we have been learning about recently on stage 1 to 5. In the project route, there is this help you asset. You double click on it, and here we go. Actors, Components, Dependency and Functions. We have two cases. One, the red one is Ninja Live component, and in this case it is embedded to Ninja Live Actor. And the second case is down below, Ninja Live component embedded to some random actor. Now, the main difference is that when embedded to Ninja Live Actor, we have the interaction volume, which is registering the overlapping objects and creating a list of these overlapping uh, objects and components, forwarding the list to Ninja Live component, and then the component is uh, capturing uh, the pivot or bone positions and projecting it to the simulation plane. Important, the simulation plane is the trace mesh itself. So we are capturing the position of overlapping objects and projecting uh, these positions to the trace mesh, to the simulation, two-dimensional simulation plane, inside the component, forwarding the data to the painter and then to the fluid simulation and here the output materials are visualizing the whole thing for us. Now, when we are uh, in a random actor, Ninja Live component could not rely on uh, the interaction volume. Instead, we have a user-defined list of components. Uh, remember this function, continuously track or continuously interact with the owner actor. Here you could define which components of the owner actor that you would like to track. Remember the torch head, for example, or you could also name bones or sockets. And once this list is complete, the component is always continuously tracking these uh, provided components and projecting the position to the trace mesh. And from this point on, the procedure is the same, the painter, the fluid simulation and the output materials. So you could compare the difference between using uh, Ninja Live Actor and Ninja Live Component separately. We also have a list of possible inputs. These are the strings that we could track as points, like uh, pivot points, sockets, bones, and stuff like that. We could also track user input, be it mouse or touchscreen. And of course, we have uh, textures, materials, and streaming camera input, all channeled to the fluid simulation by the composite material. So I really recommend this flowchart. It's nicely summing up the things that we have been talking about uh, during these five stages. And now I'm returning to the level. We are on stage six, discussing buffers, buffer visualization and output materials. A buffer could be simply defined as a temporary storage for visual data. A ninja is generating and maintaining a lot of these buffers. In the content browser, I'm checking this asset called help. And there we find a flowchart called fluid simulation data flow. The red boxes are places where we are processing data and the blue and purple boxes are simulation buffers. We could also call them texture objects or render targets. The point is and as we are processing the data, we are sending it to the next stage, to the next station, and then we are writing the data to a render buffer, to a render target. 
and these stages are connected on a certain way and these buffers are all calculated every frame and it is always available and needed to generate the simulation. Now having a look at this stage and what is happening here um, we could see that there is just a single ninja actor running the show and these two columns here could be defined as the internal state, the representation of the inner workings of what is happening in Ninja. So you could think of these colorful images as different um, states of the simulation. For example, uh, this one is the core function. Ninja is tracking uh, the motion trajectory and the velocity of overlapping objects. And so these two are the pain buffers. And then we are forwarding pain buffer information to the simulation in this second column and the fluid simulation is generating more buffers that silly one at the top which is like a, a red yellowish uh, greenish hue thing is the velocity buffer and uh, it is a vector field horizontal direction is represented by a red color and vertical is by green the second one is the density buffer and the third one is pressure, which is a scalar field with negative and positive float values. Now, we have seen that uh, Ninja is generating and maintaining these buffers every frame. And so the question is, if these are available, how could we use them to uh, drive systems in the scene? And the third column is actually a collection of examples for this. The top example is using the velocity buffer to generate acceleration for the particles. So the simulation direction is applied and pushing particles on a certain way. This is just an example, but we could also use the velocity field to bend uh, blades of grass, so to distort foliage in the wind. The next example is using simulation density as a height map or elevation map. So we are seeing an actual three-dimensional self-shaded volume here. And the brighter a density volume is, uh, the more we extrude this volume. And the third example is using the pressure buffer to distort uh, a mesh surface. But it could be used as well to generate normal maps without actually modifying the geometry. So uh, we have seen fluid simulation and pain buffers here and a few examples how they could drive uh, certain uh, visualization systems like particles, volumes or meshes. And this was like a theoretical part. But the question is, how could we uh, correctly access these buffers? What is the way, the method to, to get to these buffers and use them with our systems? So I would like to compare this nearby stage with stage 6 here stage 6, stage 7. Uh, this one is called direct drive. Having a look, it's almost similar to stage 6, but it uses a different method. So, let us start with stage 6. And in this case, we are using a classic method, which is here since Ninja Live 1.0. And this method is writing render targets the internal render targets to external on disk render targets. So we are exposing the simulation buffers by simply writing them to assets. Let me show this. I'm selecting Ninja Live, actor, resizing the components panel, accessing Ninja Live component, and under the live generic, I could see a, a triplet of parameters. The first one is called draw internal render target to external. I enable this. Then I'm picking which internal render targets, which scene buffers I would like to expose. I could add my own uh, buffers to this list or remove any of these. So it's user defined. And finally, at the third option, which is also a list, I'm picking targets. Now what are these? If I'm going there with the content browser, I could see that these are render target type U assets. It's like files on the disk and these are prepared uh, 
pre-made, prefabricated. So these assets are already here. I have created them manually. And if I click on one of these and disable the alpha and start the simulation, I could see that the Ninja Live actor is writing that pressure buffer data to this external render target every frame. Now, what is the advantage here? The advantage is that uh, it's a very easy way to expose fluid simulation data and that these render targets could be easily accessed by any external system. So you could create your own arbitrary materials and just read these uh, render targets as textures. As an example, I'm selecting this mesh here, this uh, distorted surface looking up the material it is using and in the material at the bottom I could see that uh, this render target containing the pressure buffer is manually linked to this material. So we have this fluid simulation actor writing the data to the on-disk render target and we have this object here with a material that is reading the same render target. That is the principle and it's very good and easy but also uh, we have uh, serious problems with this first what happens if I am cloning this uh, actor well we have two actors trying to write the same render target that is a conflict also I have to manually define which render targets I would like to expose and what are the destinations and I have to do the same thing at the recipient side with the water material or whatever kind of material so it's a tedious job and it's not very easy to automatize i would say it is a manual method to one by one build systems and wire them together and this has been used for a long time now with ninja live 1.7 a new method has been introduced which is called the direct drive again we have a simple single ninja simulation actor here on stage and we have uh, the same three examples particles volume and a mesh surface but this time we are not writing external render targets instead and i'm typing in the tag word into the actor details panel we have been tagging all the three all three actors so selecting the mesh you could see the actor is tagged as mesh test selecting the volume it is volume test and the Niagara is also tagged as particle test so we have been using three different tags and ninja live is using these tags I'm at live component per live generic to identify objects and apply a certain material on these objects so let us have a list of these important parameters first you see these output materials we could also call them primary output materials and this is an array you could add your own elements and ninja is always picking one of these uh, elements from the list defined by the output material selected index so we have one material we are defining this material here and you see this option apply first output material to actors with tag so I pasted mesh test here and so ninja is applying the material on this mesh the same is true for the volume smoke if I look up this array called secondary output materials and the input field below the array containing the tag volume test and finally Niagara it is again tagged and we are also using this tag to instruct ninja forward uh, the render buffers to this system um, an important bit while uh, the volume smoke and the mesh is using materials so actually ninja is applying this uh, water like and volume like material on these systems Niagara is a bit different we do not apply materials on Niagara but instead Ninja is directly exposing uh, the sim buffer to Niagara and the sampling is happening in Niagara as if I would say Niagara is running its own material but the point is that it is doing the sampling on its own and we are just providing it with this texture object 
So this thing is called direct drive and we don't have on disk render targets. Instead, we are exposing these blue boxes, these internal render targets, which we generate when the game starts, when Ninja is initialized. These objects are generated anyway. And uh, with zero effort, we could expose these already existing uh, internal render targets to materials and apply the materials on these systems. So uh, this way we could very easily uh, manage a uh, large amount of objects and materials. Additionally, I would like to say that uh, in most cases, uh, when I, uh, yeah, let's just pick a random ninja actor, for example, uh, stage four. So in the most cases, when we see a, a simple ninja visualization, the question comes that, so what is happening here? Are we talking about an external or an internal system? How is it visualized? Well, since Ninja 1.0, we had this default option of uh, having a trace mesh. And the trace mesh uh, fulfills two functions. First, as we have been discussing, uh, the data of overlapping objects is projected on the trace mesh. So it is functioning like a projection plane. And the second function, that Ninja, if it is detecting a trace mesh, automatically applying the first output material, in this case density buffer red, to the trace mesh. So before all these experimenting with external systems came along, the proto-ancient uh, Ninja was already um, exposing its internal simulation buffers to a given material called the output material. And this output material is applied on the trace mesh. So please have a look at the component details. We don't have any tag here and we don't have secondary output material. We just loaded a simple uh, buffer visualization material and without question Ninja is trying to apply this uh, on the surface of the trace mesh. So that is the default option. And so all these uh, things came later on when we started to experiment with external systems and first came up with the idea of using external render targets. And then came this idea that in case we already have uh, output materials which are already receiving the simulation buffers without intermediate render targets. Uh, so the idea is just, just to simply apply the output material. Now, uh, <laughs> here is one thing that, that, that could reveal that what is happening. So um, if I start um, stage 7, you could see this um, that the ninja simulation uh, area is actually empty, as if we are visualizing nothing there. Why is this happening? This is happening because uh, the output materials using tags are all applied on external systems. And here's this flag, we already met it. It is called trace mesh invisible. So what happens if I just uh, set it to false and start the simulation? Well, we have the default primary output material applied on the trace mesh. So as I said, Ninja by default tries to apply the primary output material on the trace mesh. That is the default. And in case we are driving an external system, like uh, this highly tested latent mesh here, uh, we don't want the trace mesh to appear. So here is this bull flag which could hide it for us. Trace mesh invisible. This way, trace mesh is fulfilling only one of its functions. It is used as a projection plane. We are capturing the position of the, the yellow sphere with the trace mesh using line tracers from the camera. And all the other things, like the materials, are applied to external systems. So trace mesh is invisible. And finally, when we are talking about direct drive, I would like to recommend uh, a dedicated manual chapter 29 discussing the new features of Live 1.7. And here is point one, direct drive, where we could uh, read what direct drive is about exactly. There is also a video covering these topic, uh, topics called Live 1.7 New Features. 
and around the third minute in the video we are comparing um, the old method of writing render targets and the new method of directly accessing these uh, systems. So I recommend you to read the manual and watch this video as well. Um, shortly that's it. We have been comparing uh, these two stages, 6 and 7, comparing the old method of writing external render targets and the new method direct drive, both available, both useful on its own. And finally, I would like to provide you um, with some technical details very shortly. When we are working with Ninja, usually uh, we are using um, material instances as output materials. If I just uh, look up this material, I could see we have a plenty. And in the Ninja Live project, altogether we have like 400 uh, material instances, which could be used as output material. Now, the good news is that um, uh, how Ninja is um, forwarding, exposing uh, the simulation buffers to these output materials is completely automatic. So the blue boxes, the different um, render buffers, are automatically forwarded to the output materials. You don't have to do a thing with that. If you open up a material, you have a bunch of parameters which you could play with, like color and normals, opacity, mesh distortion, reflection, refraction, roughness, all these, and you don't have to care with the render targets, the render buffers, it's all automatic. Still, I would like to know, uh, let you know how it works. So, in every material instance, here's this option group called General. And there, you could find this option called Parent. You could look up which is the base material uh, um, where this material instance is deriving from. By pressing on the magnifier glass, I'm jumping there in the content browser, and we have arrived to the most important base material in the Ninja project, all water, sand and snow experimental material instances are deriving from this one. We also have three other called Output Basic, Advanced and Translucent Reflective. So these are like uh, the archetypes, the base materials and all other instances are using these. We have three other important base materials under volumetrics per base for volume fog volume cloud and volume smoke. The common thing in these three materials and in this four, so altogether we have seven uh, ancient important base materials in the project and I'm opening up just one of these. So the, the common thing that these materials are already prepared with uh, texture objects and these texture objects are parameters and the parameters have been named using a naming convention and so Ninja could easily locate them and assign these buffers to these parameters. Um, talking about the naming convention, if you're curious enough you could open up Ninja Live Component Blueprint and visit module 23 called Output Materials open that one and this is the point where you could actually see these um, internal render targets exposed to these texture objects as parameters. So um, you could uh, decode the naming convention here. I also advise you to visit um, stage 6 and right uh, at the beginning of the stage descriptor text we have the naming convention defined. So what names should we use in case if we would like to access the pain buffer or the velocity or the pressure? In case you ever decide to create your own base materials you could simply duplicate one of the existing ones. You could also use these base materials to look up what names we are using it is also described on the stage and you could also debug it from the blueprint. So many ways to approach it, but uh, I think most of the users, most of you will not create base materials. Again, I'm emphasizing, 
you will probably just using um, instances material instances and so these instances are deriving from the base materials and you are duplicating them to create your own versions and you're going to tweak uh, only these um, high level parameters with color and mesh distortion and stuff you don't have to deal with uh, simulation buffers that's the good news so um, I guess we have covered <laughs> get this topic covered and compared stage 6 and 7 the traditional method and direct drive and how uh, these materials are built and used that's it this is stage 8 and we are still talking about materials I would like to show you a few tricks let's get to this part called detail mapping or flow detail mapping I start the play and as you could see um, we are using three inputs three sources to create a final composite image and the three inputs are simulation velocity simulation density and a static noise map and the way how we are using these the velocity is used as a flow map to drive the advection of the noise and density is used to mask the noise so what we have as a final result is something that pretty much resembles the original fluid simulation goes the same direction fills up the same volume but it is enriched with details and we are using this technique many times I'm opening the material which is belonging to this one and so here you could see that we have a dedicated group of options called flow map and if I uh, just a second disable flow mapping I get back uh, to the original uh, basic simulation density so uh, in most of the cases when you're working with material instances again you are simply not aware of the simulation buffers behind you just enable options like in this case with the flow map and you could tweak things like color and stuff but it's very important to know the next thing I would like to show you is how we could invert simulation density I start play and as you could see here's the original and the inverted one by selecting the output material used here we could see that we have swapped the highlight color to black and the low point color to white so it's like an inverted tone mapping and as a result we have this simulation buffer inverted now why is it good for us well uh, we have a commonly used trick called parallax occlusion mapping as you could see it looks 3d like a shaded 3d thing I could also use a freehand painter here but revealing the geometry it is obvious that we are using a fake here something that looks 3d but it's not and for the same reason it's very efficient and so how do we do this uh, the stage on the left is uh, skipping fluid simulation so it is in simple painter mode I'm selecting live component per live interaction and there simple painter mode is enabled as a second step on the live generic I have defined a primary output material this output material is doing this inversion and then and here comes the key step I've enabled this bool flag make first output available for second output so this way the result of the left stage which is uh, an inverted paint buffer is pushed to the secondary output material and the secondary output material is defined here in the secondary out materials array and we are using a tag to identify the target object which is this mesh and so uh, we have this thing running uh, the trick here is that uh, Ninja could uh, well uh, push uh, the rendered internal render targets not only to external systems but also there is a bridge between the primary and the secondary output materials so by using this bool flag you could forward materials from one buffer to the other and create complex uh, effects using these now uh, most of the cases when we would like to create sand tracks using parallax occlusion mapping we don't want to have this uh, inverted thing visualized so naturally I would try to hide it by going to ninja live component 
And look what, the trace mesh invisible is already active. So why do we see the trace mesh? Uh, it is an important uh, notice. Um, by selecting Ninja Live Actor, you could see that we have uh, this proximity uh, activation enabled. What does it mean? It means if I get further away from the stage, it becomes disabled, it is falling to sleep. It is good when you are populating levels with loads of uh, Ninja simulation actors, and your player is far away, these simulation actors simply fall asleep. Now, when this option is enabled, so sim activated by pawn proximity, in that case there is an extra option here. What happens to the trace mesh? You could pick three options. And the first option is the default, gray when inactive. A second, hold last frame. And the third, hidden when inactive. In case if I would like to hide the trace mesh with this proximity, uh, proximity activated actor, I have to switch this on hidden when inactive. And as you could see, we have our sand surface. And usually, I, <laughs> I almost feel like I don't have to say this, but yes, you would like to arrange the, the sand surface to the same location where the trace mesh is. Obviously, that's important. And also make sure that uh, this new mesh, this highly tessellated, uh, well, no, <laughs> not highly tessellated, but low tessellated sensor face is not interacting with the simulation itself. So I'm going to collision and set it to no collision. Or I set Ninja to ignore it. And this way, uh, the whole thing feels like I'm actually creating interaction between uh, the yellow sphere and the... Uh, and the sand surface. So what, what I have done is uh, to have the trace mesh disabled and hidden. I moved the sand surface to the same location where the trace mesh is, made sure that the sand is not going to interact with Ninja, and that's it. A bit tricky, but yes, we are uh, working with a complex system here. So that's one trick I wanted to show you. And finally, we arrive to a stage which is uh, often causing problems. Um, there is this um, favorite level. Let, let me quickly jump to this. Tutorial level 10A. It is called the Fluid Blast. One of the early levels that came along with Ninja. And many users um, have been um, using these templates. Again, as a good fake, so it's not real 3D, but we are using parallax occlusion mapping and a two-dimensional ray marcher to create this illusion of um, spatially extended fog. And so, oftentimes, you would like to copy this setup. And since this setup is uh, generating self-shadows, uh, there is a light source defined. If you select the Ninja Simulation Actor, and go to Live Component, there is a dedicated group of options here called Live Ray Marching. And you see, Ray Marching is enabled, and we have a light source defined. Now, the same setup is replicated on the tutorial level. Let me quickly go there. So, uh, we have this two-dimensional Ray Marching setup replicated, and uh, oftentimes uh, you would like to copy this stage to your own level, which is fine. And it is taking uh, the material definition with itself. So in case if, uh, you have this uh, Fluid Blast Ray Marcher material in the output materials list, it is taking it with, the, with itself, it's fine. But there is one important thing which will change, and it is in the Ray March definition. Probably you will not have a light source on your level, or the light source will be named differently, so Ninja is finding itself in a situation where there is no light source. And in cases like this, you will receive a warning. Please have a look at the top left corner. And it says ray marching is enabled, but hey, there is no light source to shoot the rays from. So what shall we do? And in this case, when you um, um, receive this warning, which is a very literal warning with an instruction, you just go to live ray marching. You could either disable it, or you could pick a light source to resolve the problem, and it's done. So, um, 
this is how we solve this issue of <laughs> giving a light source to the ray marcher. And that's it. We are on stage 9, discussing modularity and how to build actors from components. Please have a look at this stage. We have a single simulation actor running and all components visible are embedded to this single simulation actor. Exiting the gameplay and selecting Ninja Live, we could see that besides the Ninja Live component, we have Volume Smoke component and Niagara component added. Quickly jumping back to stage 7, where we have been witnessing a similar setup, except that we had a separate simulation actor, a separate actor for the mesh, a separate volume actor and a separate Niagara actor. So altogether it has been four actors. And despite the fact that Ninja was driving directly the other three actors, these were separate actors. Now, going back to stage 9, we could see that all these actors actually have been uh, collapsed to a single actor. Ninja Live component is a new feature, introduced in Live 1.7. Of course, uh, Niagara component by Epic is always there. And I've also added uh, a specific trace mesh, which looks like a cube. And so, in the end, I have the whole thing packed into a single actor and I could move them together and it is all controlled directly, all other components like the Niagara and the Volume and the Mesh controlled directly by Ninja. Now, I'm not getting into the details, instead I'm recommending you uh, Manual Chapter 29.6 Modularity. Also, uh, it is covered in, on a very detailed way in a dedicated video. Live 1.7 tutorial, new features and uh, all over the video we are talking about this, but we are devoting at least uh, like 5 or 7 minutes to discuss how these components are being added and how the system is built. The point is that it could be done and that is like the current stage of evolution with Ninja, having all components uh, added to a single actor controlled by the same simulation and so um, that is what we call modularity, building our own actors from components. And um, shortly that's it about star, uh, stage 9. And the next big thing we would like to discuss um, how to make things word space. Because uh, until now we have been uh, witnessing things that have been sitting at the same location like anchored or fixed to that point. And so we would like to th see things move around in the world. And so the question comes, how to make things move in the world? First, let me uh, pick the utilities actor and enable possess nearest bound. And so we are going to po possess this guy here. And so we have this aquarium, this <laughs> water box. How could we make it word space? Well, it's already word space. Only thing I did is uh, <laughs> attached it to the pound and it's behaving properly, like the, the fluid is lagging behind. So how is this happening? I am telling you, under Ninja Live component per live interaction, the bottom six options are of high interest. Here, trace mesh moving in word space and you could see texture offset automatic. So that is the default behavior, which means starting with Ninja Live 1.7, you don't have to do a thing uh, and Ninja is doing this, this job for you and basically all simulation is in word space. In case ever uh, you, you start to move this um, simulation or attach it to your own actors or moving bodies, it will, do, uh, it will behave properly in word space. So the question is, what's the problem with this, <laughs> with this big box of water? Well, the problem is that most of the times we don't want to take a tank of water with ourselves. So, uh, a logical step forward is to have a large uh, body of water placed on the level, which is not moving, and have Ninja, simulation actor, attached to the pound moving, and still uh, hiding Ninja actor, 
and somehow having the simulation buffers running on the water surface. Mm, the good thing is that we have uh, discussed all the things necessary for this on the previous stages. So, our ninja simulation is in word space by default. Ah, by the way, let me just start this stage and see what is happening here. So, um, we could see that um, our simulation is attached to the character, our simulation is hidden, and still it is controlling this large mesh. So, uh, let me uh, dissect it to parts. As you could suspect, I've been hiding the trace mesh. Let me just reveal it. So, this is my simulation in word space. If I move away from the, the big large blue area, I could see that um, this red plane is moving together with my character. So, it is the trace mesh, it is the simulation, and it is attached to the character. And as soon as I reach the water surface, the simulation buffers are correctly stemmed on the surface. And this is solved with the help of the secondary output materials. And I'm hiding again the trace mesh. Looking at the secondary out materials, here we go, water opaque minimal. And we have been using a tag in Ninja and both on the water surface. So this way Ninja is applying the water material on the water surface. And of course, um, the simulation buffers are already exposed to this material, so we are using like uh, the pressure buffer to create these these ripples, and we could use many more for uh, to create a, a more complex looking water surface. And there is also a Niagara system, so we are using the pressure to displace the particles vertically, and using the velocity buffer to to push the particles horizontally uh, to accelerate them, as we have been discussing before. But so, the setup looks like this. We have a single ninja simulation, we have attached it to the pawn. As discussed earlier, we have set the transform to absolute. Uh, the trace mesh is hidden, the secondary output material is on this surface, and that's it. Not very complicated. And that is the archetype, the prototype. This is how we set up a typical uh, word space system, be it sand or snow. Or water. So, um, without saying more about this, you could just um, examine this setup on your own, take it apart, have a look at the actor and the component details, try to recapture what has been said on the previous stages. But it's all here, a very simple setup demonstrating word space. And that's it. Stage 12. Setting up a simulation from scratch. This is the last stage in this demonstration and we are going to try to build our own uh, setup from scratch. First, uh, I have to mention that Ninja is full of examples. If you go to the content browser, you could either look up the tutorial levels or the use case levels and it is really easy to copy-paste these setups as a whole or as parts of it. I would like to provide you with an example. I go to use case level 1, which is a simple water setup with a single actor. So, I, I try to understand what are the parts involved in this simulation. And these uh, level placed texts are usually helping me. For example here, uh, you could see that the, the setup is uh, described in details. And it is actually telling us that we have a single actor and a few water meshes and that's it. So what I do is, I, cop uh, I select the Ninja Live simulation actor, I select the water mesh, press edit, copy, and if I create a new level, say the default level, I could paste the thing there, edit, paste, and that's it. Now uh, let me test if it works or not. So I'm just uh, rescaling this uh, thing a bit. I am also adding my own palm by dragging the default mannequin from the tutorial engine default. And finally, I'm also adding um, this helper Ninja Live Utilities to enable me to possess the palm.
and in theory it should work. And there we go. Our water setup is here. We have simply copy pasted two actors and that's it. And the same applies uh, for the material. In, in case I'm, I'm selecting Ninja Live Actor, I could look up uh, the material in the secondary output materials section here. Water, opaque, quiet. In case if I would like to modify this, I just go there in the content browser, duplicate it, and then I have my own version. So I don't have uh, to do uh, a simulation setup from scratch, and I don't have to do uh, materials from scratch. The same applies for the presets and all other things. So, returning to uh, our introduction level, the advised way of uh, doing things as a starter in Ninja is not to set up a simulation or a material from scratch, but to copy paste the existing setups. That is a very natural way and a very easy way to solve problems. Now, um, in case you decide to make your own setup from scratch, there is a, a crucial information that you need to know. That is mm, about the parameter space. So, uh, what are the parameters that control ninja behavior and simulation behavior? Here, that is the key information. Uh, the parameters are distributed at three locations. First, if you select a Ninja Live actor, some parameters are available here at the actor details under Live Activation and Live Interaction. Selecting the Ninja Live component, you can access more parameters. Altogether, we have like a hundred parameters. Uh, accessible through the actor and the component details panel. Next is the preset manager. You have to drop it on level, simply dragging it from the content browser. And if you start your simulation, oh, by the way, what's the name? It is called um, Ninja Live 11. So if I start the simulation and select Ninja Live 11 in the preset manager, you could see we have this list of parameters. This is approximately like 50 or 60 parameters. Things like the direction of the velocity field and brush size and stuff like that. Uh, these are called the fluid simulation parameters and so they are accessible here at the preset manager. And there is a, oh by the way, this is our <laughs> humble simulation. And uh, there is a third group of parameters and these are the output material parameters. In Ninja Life component, generic, selecting the output material. And so, again, if, I, uh, if I'm going through these one by one, it, I would find like 50, 60 or a bit more parameter depending on what kind of options are enabled. Say I enable the normal mapping and then I, I, would, I would have an um, additional four parameters popping up. So I could reduce the number by switching off things and making a very dumb looking material. But the point is that on average we have like uh, 50 parameters. Now, if I'm adding uh, these three locations and the number of parameters, so we have actor and component details, we have the preset manager with the fluid simulation params, and we have the output material with 50, 60 params, we have like 200 parameters. That is our uh, parameter space, or simulation is defined in this space. And uh, please try to understand that with Ninja you could do uh, candle smoke, or a dust in a desert, or the desert sand itself, or a water surface, or a, a cloud-covered sky. So it is a generic fluid simulation, and there is no um, instant way to create things, because these are defined by the same uh, set of parameters, tweaked differently. So to create something from scratch, you really need to understand these uh, three places and how these parameters are controlling uh, Ninja and the simulation and the output material. So I would say that you need uh, to be a very experienced user to create things from scratch. And now you know that you need uh, to rule at least 200 parameters. And <laughs> I advise you to clone things, but still, uh, let's have a look how we make things from scratch. So I would like to start with a standalone setup, where a single Ninja Live actor is delivering all the visual effects. And I'm dragging Ninja Live on level, and say I would like to set 
the character, the engine default mannequin, on fire. Let's see how the setup looks like. I'm uh, upscaling the simulation container a little bit. Also uh, renaming it to something a bit more telling, like Ninja Live Fire, and parenting it to the character. I'm also resetting the transform, like aligning it to the middle point of the pawn, and uh, changing the output material to make it a bit more uh, obvious. Here we go, live generic output materials, and I'm assigning this red one, an opaque material. And if I click play, we could see that uh, Ninja Live Actor is actually surrounding the character, and uh, <laughs> the warning in the top left is telling us that we are tracking 68 bones. A bit too much in it, so I would like to reduce this by selecting the pawn and having a look what kind of bones we have in the upper body. Mm -hmm. The head, lower arm, and the thumbs will do. So I'm telling Ninja to track these bones exclusively. And I'm going to the live interaction, creating five slots, and typing in the bone names head, lower arm left, lower arm right, thumb left, and thumb right. Yes, so we are tracking only these bones. I also would like to make Ninja camera facing. Going to the live component, the live interaction, here we go, camera facing, trace mesh. And one more thing I'd like to do is to possess the pawn. And I need a helper tool for this. I'm dragging Ninja Live Utilities on level. Enabling Possess Nearest Pawn. Setting maximum FPS to 60. And I will need a viewport widget as well to control the camera zoom. Here we go. So that's the Ninja Live Utilities. We could control the character camera and we already possess the pawn. And the simulation is surrounding it, tracking it the five bones that we have selected. And so, um, two things I would like to uh, modify, the material and the preset that controls the simulation. So I'm selecting the Ninja Live actor, localizing the preset. It's Ninja Live default, going there and creating a, a replica. Let's say Fire 1 and assign this as the default preset. I do the same thing with the material, this density buffer red. Just going there, duplicating it, and renaming it to Fire 1. Okay, Fire 2 then. And here we go. So, uh, I open the material instance. I start play. Oh, by the way, we need the preset manager to uh, tweak these simulation parameters. So I'm dragging it on level. Here we go, this black icon, and again, I select the output material, here we go with the preset manager, I pick up Ninja Live Fire, and so we have all things needed to tweak this. We have the, uh, the actor on stage, with simulation already half set up, and we have the preset manager and the material. Um, first. Let's uh, set up a monodirectional upward pointing velocity field. Here we go. And let's add uh, some noise to the brush. And lower the turbulence a bit. And that's fine. Uh, maybe we should uh, lower brush persistency and increase feedback a little bit. That's a fine smoky thing. I save it. And let's get to the material. I adjust uh, this primary color to a more yellowish hue and I'm adding a flow map uh, to get some details. Here, uh, flow map texture. What's the name? Uh, crumple will do that. Old crumple. And I set the mode to a multiplicative mode. Alright. And finally, I multiply the intensity of this effect. All right, and still, uh, the brush size seems to be a bit too small. So I'm getting back to the preset manager and setting it to 0.5. Mm -hmm. 
and now I can see that the detail map is quite large so I'm adjusting in the material flow map UV tile to 5 uh -huh. you could see it looks very fakey uh, because the simulation density is masking it so I'm lowering this masking value and increasing how the simulation velocity is influencing this flow map uh -huh. yep yep it pretty much getting look like fire and so uh, I would like to change this uh, down there the blending mode to translucent and maybe um, now that we have alpha in translucent I would like to set the alpha power a bit higher so basically that's it we have something which uh, as a starter looks like fire and it's tracking all five bones We have a custom preset and the material and there are so many other things to tweak but not yet next thing we would like to do is to create an extended setup for example a large water surface an extended setup is when ninja is controlling something that is not ninja it could be a particle system a volume or a, a landscape surface right now and creating a large simulation area and since we are covering a large area I'm also adjusting sim resolution to 1k and the output material to something more prominent here we go um, maybe a user brush should be increased as well so there we go a large 1k resolution simulation area and to make a water surface that is interactive I also have to attach it to the pound engine default mannequin ninja live being renamed in the word outliner to ninja live water attached to the pound reset transform to align it to the middle of the pound and I'm also filtering for certain bones we don't need the whole skeleton we only need two bones for the feet let's make it a uh, calf left and calf right and I also switch on the possession of the pound now let's have a look uh, it's fine but it looks like uh, our simulation area is rotating together with the facing of the pound and that is really bad for the fluid simulation so the number one rule is to make the moving object attached simulation in the transform per rotation to word aligned so we have an absolute rotation I also switch on preset manager and I set the default zoom for the pound camera to double so here we go uh, as you could see the simulation area is not rotating anymore but it is world aligned now I'm selecting ninja life water and it is using the default preset uh, let me adjust the simulation feedback a bit and increase the brush size I'm happy with this and so I'm going to uh, resave this because it is not the default preset anymore but a modified version of it so let's make it water water test one here we go and before quitting I would like to show you one thing right now we are seeing a simulation density buffer and down here we could uh, visualize other buffers and the pressure is just fine for us so this is perfect to create uh, uh, water ripples so we are going to use this right now uh, I'm selecting ninja live actor and making sure that the newly created uh, water test preset is being used and in the terms of materials we need to create one I'm going to output per base materials and word space generic and creating an instance of this also calling it water 
fast. And uh, telling Ninja to use this in the secondary output materials section. You see this? An empty array. I'm adding one slot, assigning this material. And so Ninja is trying to apply this material to a word space object. And so we have to place one on the level. I pick one large planar mesh, put it on level, upscale it big time. And finally, I am tagging this mesh. You will see why it is important. Let's tag it as water mesh. Going back to Ninja. And uh, in the Ninja Live component, the Live Generic, you could see we have this secondary output material. And here, if I provide the tag, Ninja is going to apply this material to every object that is uh, tagged as water mesh. So let us see what we have. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I first I have to uh, open the material to be able to adjust it. So. Uh, I open this up and there we go selecting Ninja Live Water I don't see a thing it is probably because the material we are using is completely transparent so I'm getting to the material overrides options and changing the blending mode from translucent to opaque and the shading model from default to single layer water now we have an error message somebody is using the depth buffer so I'm making a quick uh, investigation, figuring out it is the parallax occlusion mapping. It is because translucent materials often utilize scene depth and single layer water doesn't like it. So in case we switch modes from translucent to opaque, we have to switch this off. So I'm going to parallax mapping and using this bool flag, I'm switching it off. No error message anymore. And an interesting thing has showed up in the viewport. You just see this shiny big plane uh, behind this red trace mesh. That is the water mesh. Now we somehow get rid of the trace mesh. So um, I'm selecting Ninja Live Actor. Component, generic, trace mesh, invisible. There is another thing we need to do. And it is pressure edge masking, because otherwise we are going to have artifacts. So, uh, again, I'm calling the material, starting the whole thing again, and there we go. Uh, the trace mesh is not visible, so actually this is sim uh, simulation density visualized on the surface of this large water mesh. It doesn't look like water, does it? Let us uh, gradually adjust it to look like water. First. I'm going to the roughness and set main roughness to zero to make it like a reflective surface. And as a second step, I'm going to the normal map, switch on generate normals. And I ask Ninja to skip density and use pressure for normal. Mm, already there, but it's too faint. So I'm increasing uh, the power. And there we go. We have like a uh, Simulation pressure controlling a normal map is not enough. Uh, we need a mesh distortion. If I switch on the wireframe mode, you could see the mesh is not distorting. So how about switching on mesh distortion? And there we go. Uh, it's a bit too strong, isn't it? So uh, if I decrease the volume. Yeah, that's looking nice. Uh, next thing I would like to adjust is the the white water. I'm uh, lowering simulation density looking up the flow options switching it on um, picking a texture for it which is uh, a foam texture foam 5 and uh, it's not visible because I have to adjust a few things first is the scale I have to downscale it big time because it is in word space I have to make it stronger and I also need to um, make it a bit more persistent by adjusting this um, power function. That's fine, maybe a bit too persistent. So um, it's not moving, yeah? It looks a bit static. It is because um, this is a flow map and it is driven by simulation velocity buffer. 
But the bad thing is that velocity is masked by sim density, so I have to switch it off. Flow masking. I reduce this value, and there we go. It looks like our flow map is already having a nice uh, turbulent flow following the character. So we have a kind of white water, ripples, surface distortion, and we have successfully set up um, Ninja to, to control a large word space object. And just to prove how easy it, it is to create a large water surface, I'm just cloning the thing and rotating it a little bit and starting the whole thing again. And there we go. So it's like um, it, it's seamlessly merging because it is a word space material and I could clone it uh, or use um, Unreal's built in uh, virtual head fold mesh or whatever feature to generate this, this mesh surface. The point is that Ninja is controlling it and so it could be extended infinitely. Also waves could be added and such. You could see that in the use cases and in the tutorials. So shortly uh, that's it about generating um, word space materials. And so uh, this quick introduction has ended and I wish you uh, a good time reading the manual and uh, looking at the level placed examples and the tutorials and trying to make your way to learning and applying Ninja. So have a nice VFX time. See you.